Hi everyone, I'm Natasha Peterson. Thanks for being here with us today for our Incorporating Indigenous Foods, Plants and Food as Medicine Part 2 with Paula Johnson. We're glad she could be with us today. Feel free to introduce yourself in the chat box as we are getting started here. I'm going to begin with a couple introduction slides and then hand it over to Paula. Okay, as I mentioned, thanks for being here today and being a part of our webinar with Paula Johnson. We are funded by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration. This webinar is provided by the National American Indian and Alaska Native PTTC, P standing for prevention. Here's a map of our network and we are located at the University of Iowa in Iowa City. Today for our webinar, we uh, are providing CEUs available upon request. We are currently waiving any fees for our CEUs during quarantine um, and as a result of COVID. This session has been approved for one CEU by NADAC and participants are responsible for submitting state specific requests under the guidelines of their individual state. So please reach out to us if you are requiring a CEU. Uh, after our presentation, a handout of the slides will be available, on down, uh, available by download. We have an evaluation process that we call GIFRA. This webinar is provided by our center through SAMHSA and the participation in our evaluation lets SAMHSA know how many people attended our webinar, how satisfied you are with our webinar, how useful our webinars are to you, and immediately following this webinar, you'll be redirected to a customer satisfaction survey. So please take a few minutes to give us your feedback on this webinar. You can skip any questions that you don't want to answer and your participation is voluntary. Through the use of our coding system, your responses will be kept confidential and it will not be possible to link your responses to you. So we appreciate your response and look forward to hearing from you. So today you are non-video. Um, and you do not have the option to unmute yourself. However, we would love to hear from you in the chat box. So if you'd like to chat with us, please just click chat at the bottom of your screen or your phone. It should open up an option and a box for you to type in your responses. And if you have any questions for either I or Paula, um, please type those in now or at any point during the presentation. So I wanted to introduce today's speaker. Paula Johnson is a Cree SQ. I'm going to say this. You you say it for me, Paula, so I don't butcher the name. It's a Cree Esquia. We're, we're women, so it's the Cree woman. Thank you. Who is from Samsa Cree Nation from the Treaty 6 territory of... Musquachese. Thank you. Alberta, Canada, who now resides on the Squawky Settlement in Tama, Iowa. So Paula's just up the road from us now. Um, and this is a bit of her by that she sent us. Traditional food is my passion. As a chef, I'm influenced by traditional recipes, indigenous food sovereignty, and utilizing indigenous grown food in the kitchen. Being a graduate of the Aboriginal Culinary Arts Program through Vancouver Community College, having access to our traditional foods in mainstream society is one of my personal goals. I am also a small business owner who offers a line of essential oils that incorporates traditional medicine. I work with traditional medicine in my essential oil line, sweetgrass, sage, and cedar. I harvest the medicines I work with from my home territory. There's so much beauty from the traditional landscape, so much that you can use in food in life. So we are very excited to have Paula with us today. Paula, thank you so much for being with us. And I will turn the time over to you. Perfect. Thank you for having me today. Absolutely. So you're probably wondering why I'm wearing an orange shirt today. Today is orange shirt date in honor of all the original school children. So I wear this shirt today for my grandmother who had passed away and for my grandfather because they are both residential school survivors. So I wear this shirt in honor of them today. So as you can see on my presentation here, um, I'm going to be tell you a little bit of what I do in my background, how I started from culinary arts, which led me into my business that I'm in now. As you can see here, this is a picture from, um, from back home. These are Saskatoon berries, and we pick these, and we make, like, jams and ciders and things like that. They're, I can honestly how I describe them. They're, like, a raspberry, blueberry, and blackberry in one, and they're just amazing. 
like my grandmother, she'll make like pies and tarts and everything. They're just the best. Go to the next slide. So these pictures right here, I'm actually really big on food sovereignty and self uh, self sustainability. So the pictures you're seeing here are actually from our garden this year. So my husband and I, we actually have a basketball sized court garden. So we are able to grow radishes, cucumbers, tomatoes, corn, watermelon, squash. I love going down there, picking something, and then being able to use that in the kitchen. So I'm really big on using our own our own recipes and our own food, growing our own food. And this was this right here was a journey because I've never done this size of a garden before. So being able to walk down there and eat a tomato as you're harvesting the rest is it's it's actually a highlight for me. I really, really enjoyed it. So if you see here on the on the slide there, there's a bunch of seeds. I'm actually a seed saver. So a friends, a, like a bunch of friends of mine will actually give me seeds. I'll gift them items and things like that. I will trade. I've actually traded some of my Indian corn for ribbon skirts and things like that. So I love, I love trading. So as you see from that slide, there's like kale in there. And there's my husband in the middle there. So we first started our corn and it started to grow. At first, when we first planted, that was back in May, we just had little tiny corns. And then we went home to visit my family in Canada. And we came back and we had so much more in our garden. Look to the next slide. So this is actually one of my, this is like my heart right here. I received a grant from NASA, the Native American Food Sovereignty Association, and they helped me put a traditional buffalo hunt back in August of 2018. I fed over 300 people. Continue the next slide. From this, from this, my team of Rick Powellis, Berta Sky, and my one of my good friends, Joel Buffalo, we catered to our community and we fed over 300 people buffalo. We did a traditional meal. We took the buffalo down and then we harvested all the meat and we made a delicious meal. If you could continue to the next slide, you'll see the menus that we did. So in the middle there, food is medicine. You can just, they're just smiling there. So we did like, we did a butchering, we did bannock, we did wild rice dessert. We did, I can't even describe it. I'm still, when I look at those photos, they made me want to cry because I can't believe that I was able to provide this to my community. Because to click to the next slide, you'll see a little bit more. And this, the, we had a lineup of people coming to eat. We, we showcased indigenous food again, because we're more than like, I'm a really big person that we're more than Indian tacos because everyone thinks that's our staple as indigenous food and it's it is not there is so much more than indian tacos i was able i still get compliments and people will comment me send me messages are you gonna ever have a buffalo hunt again i said you know what i want to you know that's my goal every year is to host this but because of covid we did not have a pavo this year so i wasn't able to go home for that so maybe next year eventually i will have another another buffalo hunt and we'll make a different menu have more t more of a team and just showcase Showcase more more food. Take it to the next slide. And this is my heart right here. Um, I started my business about five years ago. And at first I was just doing like handmade wooden boxes, like jewelry boxes and jewelry sets. And then I took a class on essential oils. And I thought, what about using our own traditional medicines like sweetgrass, sage cedar, and wild mint? So my, my good friend, you've seen the slide there, he's smiling with Berta. He's a medicine picker. So we utilize medicines and I actually make essential oils from that dry herb. If you click to the next slide, you can see the process. So in these little tiny bottles here, they're actually glass tray and pendants and they are filled with sweetgrass, sage cedar and dry lavender. Everything that is in this bottle, I pick myself. So you'll see on the right hand picture there, that's actually fresh sweetgrass, it was just recently picked. And in the middle there, there is, there is um, bitterroot, sage, and cedar in those containers. We go to the next slide. It's a process. So this is actually my heart, is my, my four medicine oils. So I do a sweetgrass oil, a sage oil, a cedar, and a wild mint. And my business is doing very, very well. I'm actually surprised that when... People see essential oils, they think like, oh, like peppermint, lemongrass, all that kind of thing. But when it comes from the actual Mother Earth, like the ground, people people are excited to, to come to me and say, I love what you're doing. I love that the fact that your medicines, your essential oils smell like the actual medicine. It's like 
It's organic, it's light, it's clean, and it's fresh. It's not perfumey, it's not overbearing. So that makes me feel really good that I'm able to design something that's kind of one of a kind. It's actually from Mother Earth. The process that it takes me to do this essential oil is actually six weeks. So once I harvest the medicine, that's when my process begins. It's a lot of distilling, adding more medicine, making sure that it's pure, it's light, it's clean. If you continue to the next slide, you'll see the, the, the process it goes. So you'll see in the center there, there's a picture of dry sage. And when I make the essential oils, it, that, that's the actual ingredient. There's nothing else in there besides the essential oil, like the castor oil base, and then the dry medicine. So what you're seeing in that little tiny jar is actually six weeks, six weeks worth of work. So I'm able to only offer right now one milliliter bottles. Eventually I wanna get into bigger, bigger bottles. So all that hard work of six weeks, all that medicine, such as sweet grass, sage, cedar, and dry, like dry mint, will actually make that little tiny oil in that little tiny bottle. And these right here, this is my jewelry and my essential oil line. I actually offer seven. I do a cedar, a sage, a sweet grass, a wild mint, lavender, wild orange, and lemon. So everything is made by myself. And what led me to do this is actually when I was in culinary school, knowing that there's so much more that we can do as indigenous people. There's so much more that we can offer to the world because they only have one image of what we look like. So I wanted to showcase that we can have our own foods. We can have our own essential oil line. Eventually I wanted to get into cooking oil. Who, who would like to cook with like cedar oil when you're cooking like fish or, you know, it, it would taste, it would taste beautiful. And that's why I want to, I want to bring more into my jewelry line, into my essential oil line, more cooking, bath salts, lip balms, everything. That's my, that's my main goal is to get bigger and produce more so I can ship it all over Indian country. So right here in these photos, you'll actually see in the middle, there's actually one of my bath scrubs. And that's actually Epsom salts, dry cedar, dry lavender, and then a blend of sweetgrass cedar and sage oil in there and then on the far right you'll see actually a terraria pendant and there's a little tiny bottle of cedar cedar or sage oil with it and then the bottom left corner there you'll see like i offer five different pendants and on each of the pendants comes an essential oil bead so you can wear the essential oils on there and click to the next slide so there you go you can follow me on social media my business page come check me out see what i'm about Follow me on Instagram, my food journey. You can have me on Facebook just to follow what I'm doing because I'm really, really big on Indigenous food sovereignty, utilizing everything in the kitchen. I cook almost every single day, and I, I love it. I love making oven bannock and utilizing things from my garden. I'm very, very proud of my garden this year. I've never done that one of that size. So thank you for having me today. And if there's any questions, I'm open to discussion. Thank you so much, Paula. We really appreciate it. Um, we would love to open up for questions at this time. If yeah. you would like to type in questions in the chat box, or you can also type in questions in the question and answer box as well at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we want to open this up for discussion with Paula at this time. Uh, one of the questions that we had, Paula, was from Maria. She wants to know if she can buy the oils from you. Yes, she can. Perfect. So what's the best way to reach out to you for that? If you look on Facebook, I have a business page, and it's, it's a Cree woman designed by Paula Johnson. You just look it up and send me a message on there. I have photos um, of what you can look like on there. I have my terrarium pendants on there, the oils. Just, just send me a message, and I can talk with you and see what we can do. I, I ship all over Canada and the United States. Thank you. Okay, we have another question from Olivia Bridges. As she says, do you have any experience with indigenous food and medicine for people in drug slash alcohol addiction? Yes, I have. I'm actually, this is actually a tough subject for me right now. Um, my stepdaughter has an addiction right now and um, we've been dealing with that. So I'm trying to do the best way that I can and help her traditionally as I know to help fight this addiction. Wonderful. Paula, can you um, describe a little bit more about that process with uh, drug and alcohol addiction and what you 
usually do for those people? How I can describe is that a lot of people, when they're on like drugs and alcohol, they're, they're lost. So what is the main goal is like going back to our ways, having them heal, going to ceremonies and things like that. I, I personally don't do that, but I can actually put them with somebody who can help them go to that, like sweats and things like that. So what of our, one of my husband and I's main goal is to help it, help our daughter is to put her back to, how can I describe it? Put her, put her back to mother earth, you know, go, let her go to ceremonies, let her start cooking again. And just because addiction takes over your mind, it loses you, you become, you become no one anymore. You just, you're just lost. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to help her be, be herself again for her little girls. So what we're trying to do is put her in a, put her in programs, get her counseling. Because a lot of those programs that are like for counseling wise, those are Western mentalities. Some of those programs don't work for indigenous people, especially, especially with colonialism, what, like what residential school had done to our people. So a lot of those programs don't do as much as they could for us. So if you go to an indigenous program, you can actually get more of what you need, what is missing from you. So that's why I like to say that a lot of traditional healing, like when I, when I first started my business, when I first started harvesting, I, I was going through a tough time too. And picking out there, going on the land, harvesting, being by myself brought me a lot of healing. It brought me back to my roots and who I was. So I'm very grateful for going on the land and picking and being able to see what you like. As soon as you're done picking, you have everything in front of you. And that's when you can utilize to smudge, to to hold on you. Like I always have a piece of sage in my shoes when I go anywhere place. I even have one in my pocket. So just it's just that that connection that you have to Mother Earth as as a woman, as a man, as a child. Thank you, Paula. That guy's getting a little bit No, thank you. That's wonderful. Um, we have a lot of great questions coming in. Um, one other question we have is from Sandra. She said, "What is the sweet grass used for?" The sweet grass is a is actually used to smudge. A lot of people will use cedar. A lot of people will use sage. But we we use that braid of sweet grass to smudge. And that's the the main reason why what I why I use sweetgrass is because it's a smudge, and I use it to like it's like how I put it in oil is, is actually as a calming effect. You can put it behind your ears, you can put it on your your temples, you can put it on your wrist. It actually cools you down and relaxes you. Like when I every morning I'll actually go to my my cabinet and I where I have my medicines and I'll and I'll smudge and it makes me feel it makes me like my whole day feels better. It makes me feel calm. Because everyday life is very, very hectic, especially for myself now, because I've become guardian of two little girls and a mothering is not really my forte. <laughs> I'm new to mothering. So that's when I have to like center myself and I just smudge and I pray for a good day because like life's a journey. Every day is, every day is something new. Thank you. So we have a question from KP. It's, um, they mentioned educational pathways. Paula spoke of attending a culinary school. Any specifics? That program actually, um, I actually read about it on a Monday, and I had less than a week to move from Alberta to BC. I couch surfed for about a month and a half, and I lived in a hotel till I found an apartment. I read about this program, and I'm like, you know what? I was only going to culinary school. I'm going to do it. So my mom and I, I'm thankful for my mother. She actually drove me down to Vancouver, BC, and she kept let me couch surf. Like she couch surf with me on friends' couches, and then we were staying in a hotel for like two weeks till I finally found the apartment. Because I read about this program, and this is I always wanted to go to the culinary school, but because this program was Aboriginal, it was actually right up my alley with something I wanted to do. So I was actually the only Cree woman in my class. The rest are Coast Salish, so they're from British Columbia. And our class actually showcased indigenous food to the world. We showcased food for the 2010 and Winter Olympics. So we did a lot of like events showcasing indigenous food at different, different parts of uh, Vancouver. Show like wild salmon, bannock. We, we did a lot of that. We basically put indigenous food 
on a pl like a, a platter there showcasing who we are. So we did, we cooked a lot of salmon. We did a lot of bannock. It was, it was an amazing experience and I'm, I'm very honored to be a graduate of that program. I don't, I'm not too sure if they still offer that program, but when I graduated, there was only seven of us that had finished that program at that time. And actually a good friend of mine is actually, his name's Paul Natrell. He actually has a Bannock food truck and I'm very, very proud of him. And then a good friend of mine, Faith Vicker, she's in Vancouver and she actually has a catering business. So I'm very proud of those two people. They've continued with the Indigenous food movement and want to showcase Indigenous food rather than like the powwow food that people that people seem to know, like Indian tacos. Like when people say, oh, Indigenous food, Indian tacos kind of makes me laugh because like you're missing, you're literally missing out. Like when we did that buffalo hunt, there were so many people that day that were so grateful to have that food again. We had gravy, we had ribs, we had roast, we had everything. We even had Saskatoon berry salad there with wild rice. It was just, it was amazing. I, I, I cannot describe it. I'm actually thinking that right now. And it's just like, if I could do that again, I would actually do it bigger. I'd actually have more people to collaborate on that and do it much larger than I had done it. Thank you. Okay, we have a question from uh, Marie Erb. She says, is there a program for Native American people to connect with that, to connect them with Native foods to help with diabetes, et cetera, or is it just tribe by tribe? When I actually filled my application to come to, I, the, I, when I first got involved with like this kind of like Indigenous food sovereignty, I actually applied for this program through the NAFSA, the Native American Food Sovereignty Association, and actually brought me here to the Meskwaki Settlement for a food summit. So I got to meet people just like myself who have the same ideals of having traditional food and access. Like, I just thought myself, it was just, just me, like just the people that I went to culinary school with that believe in indigenous food. And then coming to the United States and seeing that there's so much more that, that other tribes offer. Like my tribe, actually my nation in Canada, we don't have that kind of access as most tribes do because we don't have like the same climate to grow so coming to the united states and seeing what other tribes have is it's it's amazing like here in the meskwaki settlement they have the red earth gardens and they grow beautiful food they harvest and things like that but i know there's other tribes like i went to michigan last year the pokagan potawatomi indians and they have their own programs there there's different tribes that have their own programs it's just having the person to talk to to access to get that uh, the lines to build things so you can have that in your community like if it wasn't for nasa allowing me that grant i wouldn't be able to host that beautiful buffalo hunt and having more come from that when we did that buffalo hunt there was actually more people doing that at now people do it on a smaller scale not the large scale that we had done but they're doing it on a smaller scale it's like having that community freezer where people come access frozen frozen meat like venison and buffalo and, and anything else like even duck so it's a community freezer that elders can people elders can access or people who are on low income can come like collect food but there's a lot there's so many tribes that are doing their own indigenous food sovereignty it's just finding them and building a building a relationship with them and continue to see if you can take that program like you have that foundation and using that in your own community without Without NASA, I wouldn't be able to, to have done that for my own community. Thank you. The question from Ken Hoyt saying, what are the barriers to starting making essential oils? Is it a lot of equipment? For me, it, at, at first, I thought it was going to be a, a lot process, but the, the hardest part is actually harvesting, having medicine, harvesting, like having it in big containers and harvesting that medicine to put in those containers. Cause that is a lot of like work to go out there with picking on your hands and knees, putting it, you know, cleaning it, preparing it. That that's the hardest part for me is that just harvesting that medicine. Eventually when I'm done, when I'm doing my process, like that little tiny, little tiny bottle there, that that's actually an enjoyable part for me. People think it's tedious to fill little tiny bottles. I love it. But the most important part, the most hardest part, not important part, but hardest part is actually harvesting that medicine utilize it because I have containers in actually my little tiny storage room where I is actually like basically a year worth of medicine that I have and that's what I utilize when once I'm done like towards the end of the container then I'll have to go back out and harvest again so I have a lot of medicine on me 
so that I can continue to do my process. I actually started a bunch of oil yesterday, so that's going to actually take another five and a half weeks to do. So I'm, I'm very happy with the product that I've been able to do, the product that's very natural and it's very light, because I know that a lot of people will buy into, like, the bigger brands, and they're kind of, like, perfumey. But the way that I do it, I'm very – Okay, how can I describe it? Just knowing that it comes from the land and from my own hands, it makes me smile that I can actually give this to people and showcase like indigenous grown essential oils. Thank you. Susan McVicker was wondering if you can use your oils in a diffuser. Yes, you can. I've been asked that so many times. Like my mom wears them as perfume. She's actually my inspiration to begin with because she can't wear like like perfumes and body sprays and things like that. So I created, she was like the, my, my inspiration for this, you know, and she, and when I hug her, I can actually smell sweetgrass on her and I can smell, I can smell peppermint on her too, like wild mint. I always say like wild mint, but then I put a peppermint stone on it. So. Wonderful. Okay. We have a question from Callie walks over ice. Do you have any suggestions for beginning everyday cookers? such as what fruits or vegetables or spices to always have on hand. Never second guess yourself. Like you look up at a recipe, like I have in my kitchen here, I've built a big spice cupboard and I just open it and I look in there and I was like, if I need this, I'll go to the grocery store and get another, another spice. Like you don't need like those 200, $300 knives, you know, just something that you're comfortable with. Like as long as you have good cooking pots, like, like the stainless steel or the steel or the stainless steel or copper pots, even a skillet, like the cast iron pans, those are like you could use to start cooking. Like as long as you have that mind to cook for your family and give a good meal, it's all up to you. It's what's, it's what's in your heart and how you feel about it. You don't have to, you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be a chef. Cause I, I, even though I went to culinary school, I still, I don't still consider myself a chef. I'm just, a, I'm still learning too. Thank you. Ayana Adams says, do you see teaching slash mentoring others in the future to start their own business? When I met other people here at the food summit, I, we, we talk, basically talk almost every other day. And they're, they're talking about how <clears throat> just going like myself when I went to culinary school, it inspired them to go back to school. Like you don't need to go to culinary school to be, to be a, to be a chef. As long as you have that passion, like, I always wanted to go to culinary school. And then when I found that program, that's what I, that's what I did for, it was for myself because I always loved cooking. Like my mom always put me in the kitchen growing up. So I just, I cooked and then I went to culinary school and I honed my skills and I became a little bit better, I think, but you know, I don't have to, I don't have to prove to anyone. No one has to prove to anyone their cooking capabilities. There anything If you can, you can do anything your, your mind wants, your heart wants to. We want to go to culinary school, go. You, you don't need that, like that foundation to go to culinary school if you have a passion for it already. Thank you. Dave Natsaway says, do you have a program for Native youth to bring them closer to traditional food awareness? You know, that'd be, that'd be actually a goal of mine then, is to go, like, go back to my community, connect with someone to take them on on the land, teach them how to harvest, teach them how to hunt, teach them you know, there's so many men in our community that know how to do that, know how to hunt. It's just honing those skills to that. You can take it from, like, the land to the table to serve to, to families, to serve to community. Like, when I did that buffalo hunt, like, I actually had a gentleman by the name of Josh Littlechild. He is the reason why we had buffalo. He took that buffalo down, and he always thanks me for allowing him to do that. And it was – you don't need to thank me. We just – we did it, and we wanted to showcase – indigenous food and that was my main goal because i'm getting tired of for me i'm getting tired of oh indian tacos this indian tacos and no 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 we're much more than that there's so much that that comes from the land there's so much that can come from us my like my mom she has a book in in cree that's actually recipes for my great grandmother and a lot of the teachings that i know come from came from my great grandmother came from my mom so she she taught me how to do a lot of things and i get a lot of I get messages when I make bannock for supper and people are like, can I have some of your bannock? I'm like, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll give you bannock. I'll make, I'll make a tray of bannock 
for for someone it's just it's because i i love cooking it's it's part of me thank you ken hoyt has another question here was the obstacle on the buffalo hunt more about permitting and tags or was the main challenge logistical and getting the group and equipment together to pull it off basically the group and equipment to pull it off because at first it was just myself and two others and it's just put i can I could think back to when we first started. I think, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I can pull this off, you know, every, because we actually did uh, through our traditional powwow, we have a, a three day powwow. And I thought, am I going to pull this off? Am I going to pull some time for, off for powwow? Is, am I going to let people down? Am I going to not have enough help? Am I going to not have anybody to help me take down a buffalo? It was just a, the fact of talking to people, building that relationship and then telling them what my goal and my dream was to showcase a buffalo hunt because no one's ever done that and I think back to that all the time it's just like how did I how did I pull it off I still think about that and the team that we had the kitchen um our education system there with having muskogees they actually lent me a kitchen that we could cook that that meal and then when we had all those people lining up at the powwow saying thank you they were very like grateful and honored to have that that on their plate and if you if you look at the slides there, there's that one photo there, and you, there people are smiling and they're standing in line and they're. I had a lot of people come up to me and I said, "Are you the one that put this event together?" I said yes, and they gave me hugs and a lot of those people had made me cry because they were so hum they were so grateful and it made me feel humble that I was able to give this to my community, and I wish I could do it again, and hopefully in the next year I can actually do do it one more time. But in a bigger, it, how, it was on a small scale, but in a larger scale. Maybe we can meet, we've only fed 300, maybe we can feed up to 1,000. You never know. There was only like myself and three others that had cooked. But if we have like a group of 10, we could, we could make it much larger. We could do much more than, than we, what we had done. It was, a, it was a lot of work and a lot of manpower to pull it off, but we, but we did it. And I'm very grateful to my team, like Rick, especially Rick and Berta. She was 87 years old and she was out there cooking with us. Thank you. Maternal Mental Health says, I don't know if I missed it, but what kind of food are in the buffalo hunt? We utilize a lot of like berries. The stuff, because I'm, I'm from Alberta. So I pick a lot of things from my own territory. I, I can't speak for this territory because I'm, I'm not from this territory. So I, I, a lot of my stuff comes from Treaty 6, like my home territory, Muscogee's. So we have a lot of like berries and wild meat. So we, I utilized wild rice and berries like Saskatoon and we did potato. A lot of the stuff was grown, was actually grown off the land and we utilize that in our food. So what our, what our main course was, was buffalo. And when we used that buffalo, we made roast, we made steaks, we made dry meat, we made even ribs. And that's what we had. I and mean, we made a gravy from that, from that, um, that buffalo. So everything that was given that day was from a buffalo. Everything that everyone had on their plate had eaten that day was buffalo. So we had, even though we had potatoes, we had carrots, we had salad, we had onions. That was from the land. And then we had our berries, like our dessert and that. The main thing was buffalo. So I wanted to make sure that everyone who had eaten that day was aware that this was harvested by ourselves. Like everything, like we took it down, we we butchered it, we cooked it. It was it was a lot of work, but we were able to like we were towards the end we just there was a lot of meat left over. I think we had like over three hundred pounds worth of meat and we just gave it away to community. People who were holding ceremonies like feasts and that we, we gave them what we had left over because there was so much that from one buffalo that we had. There was so much there was so much. I can't, I can't even describe it. Thank you. Tony Walton was wondering, what is a good resource to help identify therapeutic botany when going on hikes or camping? Is there a book or an app you can recommend for knowledge? There's actually a woman I had met her here in Meskwaki when I came to the food center. Her name is Linda Blackout, and she's from South Dakota. And she's a botanist, and she is amazing. Like, I went on her, her, um, her foraging walks and like she just she can just point out something to you and tell you what it is and I was actually surprised by that I never knew even when I harvest what what's there 
what's what I'm walking on. And there's actually a book by Robin Kimmerman. It's like, it's called Braining Sweetgrass. And it's like, it, she talks about utilizing traditional medicine. There are other, there's so many books that you can buy on Amazon or in bookstores like Chapters Indigo, where it'll tell you about what is there, what you can use. There's, there's pages on Facebook that I'm part of and you add yourself to it and you can read what other people utilize those things for. And that's what I, that's what I did with my business because a lot of people just use them in like teas and things like that. I just, I decided to, I was going to do essential oils. So that's where my process began was just utilizing medicine from my territory, deciding let's, let's make essential oils. And at first I didn't know what I was doing, but then it like, she led me into what I have now. And it's been five years, five years since I've, I've been in business and what I've been able to do. Thank you. Okay, that brings us to the end of our questions that we have in our question and answer section. If anyone else has any other questions, please type away. Uh, we have a couple more minutes here with Paula. Paula, is there anything that you, or any advice you could give to someone if they want to do the same kind of process that you're doing now? Just send me a message and I can guide you as much as I can because it, it's still a learning process for me. Sometimes I think I don't know what I'm doing, but then when you sit there and you experiment, you you find a way to do things. I never thought I could make an essential oil from a dry medicine, and I have. And it's right now, like, I offer seven oils, and it's, I can't believe it. I do seven oils, and people send me messages, and I get to ship my essential oils all over the United States and Canada. I can't believe that I've been able to travel to showcase my business. People will still send me messages and ask me, is there a way that I can get more oil from you? Because I love it. It's, it's natural. It's, it's light. It's like, I think it's because it's from the land and it's from traditional medicine, like sage, sweetgrass, cedar, and wild mint. It's something that you can't really buy in a store. Like people go to like Walmart and buy essential oils. There. It's it's not the same. It's not the same as something that you put your your tears into. You know your your sweat when you're out there harvesting off the land. It, it's it, it's ceremony in itself. It's it makes you feel good. It makes me makes me feel good that I'm able to take something from my my own backyard and harvest and put to use as an essential oil. And if I could tell anybody. If they wanted to do it, do it. No one's, no one's going to stop you. No one stopped me, and I, and I keep going, and I keep getting bigger. And I'm very, very grateful to any to everyone who's come to my business and sends me messages, likes my business page, buy, buys my product. I'm very grateful to every single one of those people. Thank you. Marie Herb mentioned that. Um, she says, for as far as therapeutic botany goes, the inventors of EMDR – um, eye movement, eye movement desensitization, mm, that's, that's a hard word to say, and reprocessing that they do in the VA hospitals with PTSD. Um, she said, learn that technique in woodwalks. You are doing the same thing, universal healing from the earth, but in creature tradition, it sounds so healing. Thank you. And we also have gotten many, many uh, comments in our chat box um, saying that you're amazing and please continue your work that people are loving this information. Um, we are so glad you could be with us today. Um, is there anybody else that has any other questions um, as long as we have Paula on today? Just let me know if I talk too fast because sometimes I, I sometimes talk really, really fast. <laughs> no, you're doing great. Thanks so much. We also actually had someone in the chat box, um, KP, uh, give a link to recipes and more, a sample from Oglala Lakota's Sioux Tribe. Yes. Um, and it's a Keep It Sacred link. So um, they said also the community trades harvested foods on Facebook, and it's a great local resource. Um, so that link is in the chat box. Um, and we've gotten some suggestions of an American Indian eatery in Denver called... Yes. 
Tokabe. Tokabe? Yes. I actually met him, actually, when I first came to the Meskwaki Salem, and I met him, Ben Jacobs. Yes. Wonderful. Um, and you have some people saying that they'd love to volunteer for doing something like a buffalo hunt again, if you're ever taking volunteers. <laughs> you have people that are very excited about it. I would love that. Like, you you have to be there. I, I can't describe that, that, that rush of doing something like that and feeling good and have people come up to you and thank you and hug you and make you want to cry for giving that, giving that kind of food to them. Cause a lot of them don't have that anymore. Like they don't have access to traditional foods. They don't have access to someone that cooks it on a daily basis. And I, I, within my home, try to do that all the time. I have deer meat in the freezer. I use squash. Like my husband's actually drying some squash right now and the corn, like I've never, because I'm from Alberta. And we don't have access to Indian corn. And this is my first year growing it and being out there with him, him showing me how to do everything. Like once it's picked from, picked from the stock, how we peel it, we boil it, and then we take it off the cob and then we lay it out to dry in the sun. So after that process, we're able to, how we did it was we went like this into a bowl and we got rid of all that. That's like basically the dust is called, how he described it was corn dust. So we went like that and how we stored it. We have in like these big jars and these are, this is Indian corn that's, I, that's from our, that's from our field, from our, from our garden. I can't believe that we were able to do that because we planted in May and I was very happy to see that. Like I planted all those seeds myself and every, every seed, he told me to, to think good thoughts. So as I was out there, I was always talking into my corn seeds, you know, and putting them down into the ground. And that's what my mom always tells me. When you're picking medicine, you say a prayer. And when everyone eats, like, you never cook when you're mad. You never cook when you're sad because your emotions will go into that food. And people will taste your emotions and feel 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 you. So every time I'm cooking, I always try to feel happy, try to feel good, because I know that I'm feeding my family. And that's exactly what I did with my corn. I gave that blessing as we planted. And then when I look outside there, I can see what, what we had done. And just looking out, my, out, out inside on my, on my porch that my garden provided so much food to us. I've actually given it away to, to some of my friends and some of my, my husband's family here. And it's just amazing that that stuff was actually grown. I did that. We planted that. And it's, if I, like my mother had her own garden this year and I'm very proud of her because she's never had a garden, garden before. And I've never had a garden this size, like a basketball court size garden. And it was, it was amazing to go out there and harvest and bring that thing into, bring the items back into your home and r- rinse them and start eating. Like as I'm out there picking tomatoes, I'm eating them because they taste like there's a bit of sugar in there. And they're so good. And it just, it makes me so proud that I did that. My hands did that. Like, like I'm not really used to the, the Iowa weather here, like the humidity and I'm just sweating out there, but I'm still harvesting my food to bring it inside and utilize it. It just, I, I can't describe that feeling. It just, it's amazing what you can do, what you can grow, what you can bring to your table. Thank you. Ken was wondering, what are some of the names of the t- corn types? So the corn type that we use was a white corn. It's like a white flint corn. There's actually a lot of different types of corn. I'm not familiar with most of them, but this, the, the corn that we had here was a, was a white like corn, flint corn. And this is a personal question that I have for you, Paula, but I was wondering um, what has been the challenge between where you're from and now living in Iowa, the differences? Um, have, has there been something that's been more difficult growing here as opposed to growing things back home? Or have you had to make a lot of adjustments in your growing and cooking? One of the main things is probably we don't have access to like sage and sweetgrass here, nor cedar. So a lot of the medicines that I work with, when I do go home, I have to harvest and I'll bring them back with me because I don't have access to sweetgrass here, nor do I have sage or cedar. So a lot of the thing, like the medicine wise, I have to go home and do that because that's from my, like my home territory, like my backyard. If I were to go get sage, I'd probably have to go to another area that grows sage. And sweetgrass, it's because our, our community, my community at Musk, which is actually considered the medicine chest. So we grow a lot of like sweet grass and sage and cedar and wild mint. So you have to, 
basically be careful when you harvest things. Like you never pick them out from the root. You always cut above the root so that plant can grow again. So if I were to give like a little bit of advice when you're out there harvesting, do not pick it from the root. Use the scissors, use it like peel back the grass very clean and cut. Do not pull it from the root because you can actually end that plant's life and it will never grow again. And one of the main my main like areas for me here is that because I'm not really familiar with what can grow here in Iowa as to what can grow in Alberta, Canada. My like my mother's garden was a lot different than ours because some of those things can't grow as opposed here because we have a longer growing season and we have a lot of the weather is a different type here than it is in Canada because we start getting cold in October, November. And like right now I have a lot of things still growing even the weather's going to get cold and like obviously I have to go pick and redo the garden again for next year. But a lot of the stuff from I know cannot grow in Alberta because we don't have that, that hot heat and humidity. Thank you. Um, Ken made a comment in the chat box. Uh, we got some Oneida white flip corn from the Food Sovereignty Summit by Green Bay, Wisconsin. We planted it in Idaho and Washington State. And many of the kernels had purple stripes, which might have been from deficiency, but we thought it was neat because the purple is the, oh, I'm not going to be able to say this word correctly, Adonisani color. <laughs> so you want me there you go. Thank you. Iroquois color, he said. Wonderful. Okay. Do you have any other questions or comments for Paula? Paula, thank you so much for all of your knowledge that you shared with us today. It's been wonderful. Um, we're excited for all of the people that shared their excitement today um, and that you are following your heart and you are able to provide so many people with your, your abilities. And we are grateful for you coming on and sharing with us and our, our uh, listeners today. Um, I'm going to share one more time your, the screen um, that has your, the information of your uh, Instagram page. Um, like Paula said, feel free to reach out to her with any questions that you may have. Um, she seems like someone that loves to share. So we're, we're so grateful for that. Um, and today is a little bit different. I mentioned at the beginning of our uh, webinar today that once you close out, uh, you'll be redirected to the Gipper link. However, today we're actually going to send out that link in an email for all the participants who are on today. So if you're not able to fill out our evaluation uh, at the moment, please just click on that link in our email. We will also have the slides available um, if, with permission from Paula uh, to share with people today. Um, and you can look at those beautiful pictures that she shared with us. Um, and so Thank you for all for joining us today. Um, please let us know if you have any other topics you want us to cover or share. Um, we have our PGTC uh, regular sessions. Um, oops, I'm sorry. I think I, can you see this slide? <laughs> there we go. Um, our PGTC listening <clears throat> sessions, as well as our webinars every month. Um, if you are wanting to know or trying to find any more um, topics that we're covering, please go to pttcnetwork.org slash native is our website. Um, and we also have topics for addiction and mental health. So thank you so much, Paula. We really appreciate it. Um, you have lots of people thanking you for sharing today. And we look forward to seeing those of you that joined us at our next session. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. It was, it was amazing to be here and talk about my love of essential oils and traditional foods. It's just, it's, it's amazing that someone else can inspire others to do things. And I hope a lot of people take inspiration from what I do and pursue their passion. If you want to have a small business or go to culinary school, do it. Just, just do it. Thank you so much, Paula.
Thank you.